especially of an animal in a wild state after escape from captivity or domestication. Alcatraz, Arab Spring, one billion rising. Freedom schools, the Maroons, rebellion thriving. We've been rising since the dawn of creation. So in the blood of our veins, liberation runs. Welcome to Feral Visions, a decolonial feminist podcast brought to you by Liberation Spring. I'm your host, Anjali Nathupadia. We begin with a content note or trigger warning. Here at Feral Visions, we go deep, and that often means courageously addressing white supremacist, imperialist, heteropatriarchal, capitalist, settler, colonial violence in order to support healing and transformation. Bypassing isn't an option. The only way is through. The time for denial is over, and today's a great day to keep it real. Amidst the show's focus on unapologetic truth-telling, then, please practice excellent self and community care while listening. Where we can all attain emancipation from oppression, break the chains from Haiti to Tibet and worldwide. Don't forget the resistance in our roots and resilience in our breath. In the blood of our veins, liberation runs. We are standing on the shoulders of the ancient ones. Welcome, folks. How about we go ahead and begin to get into it then? So have you observed how the tech industry advertises corporate responsibility while it's actually gentrifying, exploiting child labor, violating our privacy, trashing the planet, and fueling social unrest through rapacious extraction? Isn't the delusional desire to colonize space the logical extension of some of the most violent injustices within all of recorded human history? Are you over this kind of tech bro dystopia? All these shiny distractions from our most vital needs. If you ask me, what we desperately need is to digitally detox from some of these kinds of uh, forms of distraction and diversion from what otherwise could be considered uh, ways that could be more generative or supportive of us attempting to get free. So as Audre Lorde so famously shared, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Speaking of which, what exactly are tools? Are they the same as technology? Let me pull up a little something that I want to share with you if I'm able to. I'm noticing here that the formatting is actually different than just last week. Wow, I'm deeply offended. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and have a look then at uh, the etymological right foundation of tech. Yeah, no, it's totally new today. And I had so many bedazzled images I wanted to share with y'all. I am so offended. Uh, but we can scope out again where on earth this term even comes from. So as you can see here, right etymologically technology as a term comes from the 1610s right as a discourse or treatise on art or the arts from the greek technologia and looking at that right taking it back a little bit further it originally referred to grammar actually techno so combining Techne, right? So art, skill, craft and work, method, system, and art, a system or method of making or doing, which comes from, right, etymologically, craft of weaving or fabricating from a suffixed root of to weave or also to fabricate. So if this is the basis of technology, what then is technoskepticism? A leading technoskeptics website says the following. We don't hate technology. If that were true, we'd be walking into your house barefoot to deliver this magazine as an epic poem. But we approach it with caution. 
we may not individually agree on which technologies are or aren't worthwhile, but we do agree that this sense of inevitability, this sense of serial acquiescence to what technologists insist is progress needs to be halted. We encourage you to join us. Think before you adopt. Make informed choices. People may consider us naysayers or Luddites, and that's fine. We're not trying to be balanced because the scale is already a thousand to one tilted in favor of new technology. So why do I bring this up here? Because my invitation is neither to techno-optimism nor techno-pessimism, technophilia nor technophobia. These are binaries, and like most binaries are false. Rather, we need to recognize the stories we tell about technology and what they have to do with, which is so often about evolution, so-called progress, so-called development, colonialism, the earth, and suppressing and diminishing the knowledge and wisdom of certain peoples. So we could look to, for example, right, even if somebody was to search technological progress within the context of Wikipedia, a site that millions of our loved ones actually take seriously. I hope y'all are sitting, this is horrifying, but what does Wikipedia say if you search technological progress? They say, many sociologists and anthropologists have created theories dealing with social and cultural evolution. Some have declared technological progress to be the primary factor driving the development of human civilization. So please pay attention to some of this languaging and see if anything is a little bit of a red flag for you. So they say, right, talking about one scholar, they've got three major stages of social evolution within their understanding of tech. You wanna guess what they are? This is legit the language that they use savagery, barbarism, and civilization. And how does this right alleged scholar right differentiate between savagery, barbarism, and civilization? They say that they can be divided by technological milestones. For example, fire, right? And they also say, so another scholar, I know, right? That the measure by which to judge the evolution of culture was energy. And what do they mean when they bring in energy here? Scope this out. For white, of course their name is white, quote, the primary function of culture is to harness and control energy. So according to white, right, there's this differentiation between five different stages of human development. In the first stage, this is where we're allegedly primitive, right? People use the energy of their own muscles. In the second, when we're evolving, humans use the energy of domesticated animals. In the third stage of evolution, according to this take on technology, humans use the energy of plants. So think here about the so-called agricultural revolution. And the fourth, I know, right? They learn to use the energy of natural resources. You know we can problematize that phrase. So think here, coal, oil, and gas. So my editorializing, right, would see like, wow, Capitalism is legit being enshrined in this definition as a sign that somebody is civilized culturally and in terms of their society. Are y'all noticing this? Right? Uh, and in the fifth, right, when you know you're like the most civilized possible, like peak evolution, guess what Wikipedia says? Humans are harnessing nuclear energy. This is legit a page that people are looking to like it's just neutral, it's just describing different right milestones of technological development. Um, I could go on. Uh, I'll just share one more little something, right, that it's backed up by multiple other so-called scholars that are extrapolating on these theories saying, check this out, in their own words, Culture evolves 
as the amount of energy harvested per capita per year is increased. So literally, right, say for millions of our loved ones, youth that might be working on a school project, wanting to learn about technology, thinking that they're scoping something out that's allegedly neutral and objective, just fact-based, this is what, right, they're being taught about technology. Are y'all noticing anything funny about the language here? Please feel free to share in the chat if there was anything that you noticed there that was sketchy, because I could share a few things, right? So one, did you notice this kind of right extractivism or vampirism that legit was being coded as development, progress, evolution, civilization. These are some of the oldest colonial mythologies that we could possibly be invoking here, right? So fetishizing newness, right, which gets wrapped up in planned obsolescence, right? Ageism can often be at play in this kind of storytelling also, right? Or seeing these ideas of modernity as somehow in contrast with what gets kind of stereotyped as tradition, and then people buy into that binary as well, right? Super extractive, super exploitative, and it's literally just masquerading as neutral, as objective. Like, this is just technology. We're just keeping it fact-based. This is just data-driven. There's nothing to look at here, nothing controversial or contentious. Uh, and so why would I want to bring this in, right? Also, because that consumerism is so dangerous legit, right? The idea of using more energy being equated with people being more civilized. Can we in 2020, right? Harvesting, absolutely. I know maybe an oil company sponsored it. And this is just unapologetic petro-capitalist propaganda. Exactly, right? We can see in this moment of obvious climate catastrophe, right? How ominousidal those kind of biases are, but they are literally just masquerading as fact. So I also wanted to share with you something that is not showing up right now. Oh, Instagram switching things up uh, on the fly for us. So that epic meme, courtesy of Decolonial Meme Queens, if you're not already familiar with it, please do check it out at some point. Um, the one that names, right, just because white people couldn't do something doesn't mean it was created by aliens, right? And what is the kind of intervention the decolonial meme queens is making there. So for one, in talking about the Moa at Rapa Nui, or so-called Easter Island, if we're going to use the colonial name, and also talking about, right, ancient Kemetic pyramids, right, or in present-day Egypt, the way that so many folks engage in storytelling about those technological achievements in a way that legit makes it seem impossible to acknowledge that people of color could have created said things. Um, and so if you haven't seen it, I'll just share it real quick, right, via my laptop so you can have a look. Um, it's pretty amazing if you ask me. So again, here, just because white people couldn't do it doesn't mean it was aliens. And so again, it's funny, but the reason I want to bring in this analysis is because also here, there's that same kind of predictable racist colonial bias, where did you notice, again, right, if white people or if folks in, right, what today would be considered the continent of Europe, did a thing historically, folks are like, oh, of course they did that thing. But then if it's something impressive that people of color did, folks today are like, how is this possible? How could it have happened? Must it have been aliens, right? So you could even look to, for example, TV shows like Ancient Aliens that can perpetuate some of, right, this low-key racism and colonial mentality. But again, all kind of trafficked or smuggled through languaging related to uh, technology that's allegedly, again, somehow objective or neutral. Uh, and so, 
To get into this a little bit further, I want to bring in some insights from a buddy of mine who's a professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, Dr. Brian Kamali Kawada, from an essay of his that's called, We Live in the Future, Come Join Us. And so when somebody critiques a new form of technology, they're sometimes accused of, he says, right, living in the past, living in the Stone Age, being Luddites, being allegedly anti-science, anti-technology, or anti-progress. Have any of y'all heard something like this before? Since it's such a common refrain, it might be beneficial to unpack. So if living in balance with the earth is considered a thing of the past within someone's imagination, maybe this makes sense. And speaking of which, which communities are associated with the past and which groups get associated with the future? So something else that comes up quite often is that if somebody is critiquing a new form of technology, they sometimes get accused of being hypocritical if they use any modern technology at all. Have you ever noticed that before? Uh, and around that, so Dr. Kawada talks about, right, all of these phenomena within the context of, right, the TMT, right, the 30-meter telescope that's being proposed on Mauna Kea on Big Island or Hawaii Island in the Hawaiian archipelago. Um, and what he noticed is, quote, that short-sighted model of, quote, progress, end quote, that we seem to be standing in the way of hinges upon all of us, all of Hawaii's people, all of the Pacific's people, all of the world's people, losing connection to land, to sea, to other human beings. The less you feel these connections, the easier it is for you to be convinced that unrestricted development is the highest and best use of the land. And so, you know, it's super important for me that we take seriously the way that technology is just a site where so often the same old colonial mentalities are getting perpetuated, but again, under the auspices of objectivity. And around this, I would like for us to listen to a couple of minutes of a talk from Dr. Kim Talbert, where she really outlines a little bit of what is at stake here. Let's just have a listen. Uh, so I'm really, really leery of this language of who's rational and who's not rational, who's logical and who's illogical. I think a lot of times that language is employed to discount critiques that really critiques of power. And so I'll just, you know, focus on indigenous communities. A lot of times when we are making noise about the unjustness of a scientific project or a technological project, we are critiquing power. It is a very sophisticated political critique. Scientists and engineers don't want to hear it. So where do they go? You're irrational. You're anti-science. You're backwards. So that is a form of uh, they're really taking refuge in the privilege that has accrued to them as scientists. And I see this, again, because it's the same basic conversation about who's rational and who's not as a new and emerging form of whiteness. And so when I use the term whiteness, I, again, I'm not talking about skin color. I'm not necessarily talking about ancestry from Europe, although I would say most white people are <laughs> the way we think about that racial category. But if that notion of rationality is kind of being conflated with uh, that category, then you can see how other people can kind of take up that, that discourse of, of who's more rational and civilized, even though their skin color might be different or their phenotype might be different. And they, they can try to get access to some of the privileges of whiteness. We may need a new word for that. Uh, Cheryl Harris is a critical race scholar. We were sitting, we were at a, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, panel at, at DePaul uh, Law School a few years ago. And she, she said, I'm thinking a lot in terms of post-racial whiteness right now. And everybody in the room was like, what? Uh, they don't want to see whiteness 
as a category or an idea disconnected from race, meaning biological race or phenotype, people were very uncomfortable with that. And she said, I don't really have an example for that. And I said, I have an example, scientists. You can have a whole bunch of brown and black scientists sitting around the table. I had just, in fact, come from a National Institutes of Health meeting where I felt so incredibly oppressed and marginalized. And there was a whole bunch of African scientists there. There were probably even some indigenous scientists there. But they were taking up this language, you know, this language of rationality and, and marginalizing anybody at the table who had a critique of the genome science that was going on. And I'm like... So... Uh... I'm so incredibly grateful that plenty of us have had the opportunity to get into some of these insights from Dr. Kim Talbert together within the context of our Liberation Spring class, techno-skepticism, and why, in part because, do you see what she just broke down for us there? That so often, right, whiteness is just getting retrofitted under the auspices of technological development, like that, right, extractivism or that vampirism that came up in that Wikipedia page on measuring technological progress that we were just breaking down together. So do you see how she's applying this to STEM more broadly, whether it's in the sciences, so-called natural sciences, or so-called social sciences, in technology, in engineering, in math more broadly? So often, again, these colonial mentalities just get all encoded as rationalism, as empiricism, as being logical, quote, end quote. And so often those are seen as beyond reproach within the mainstream culture or just put up on a pedestal as if they're unmediated, right? It's just fact-based. It's just truthful. There's nothing to think about here. And the thing about that is it's actually much more complicated than that. Uh, and so I really invite us to take seriously some of those insights that Dr. Talbert just shared with us related to whiteness, right? Getting, right, camouflaged in STEM fields, and especially in a way that's weaponized against BIPOC communities, as she was talking about specifically indigenous communities, when it comes to having incredibly valid critiques of different development projects. And so on that front, taking it back to, right, this piece around, right, the TMT or the 30 meter telescope, right, on Mauna Kea, on Big Island in Hawaii, Dr. Kawada writes, all these things done in the name of rootless progress show unsurprisingly little care for trying to truly progress and create a future that we all want for the coming generations. And so that makes me think about a field that some of us call decolonial futurisms. So on that front, who gets to determine the future? Do we get to play a role in co-creating the future? If so, what visions are we stewarding? And what kinds of technology might or might not be included in our visions? I bring this up in part because so often it's just kind of presumed that these technologists or these tech bros coming out of Silicon Valley have more of a monopoly on being able to determine directions moving forward into an imagined future than everyday people and all of the rest of us. And that's super problematic if you ask me. Fatalism can be really common here. I don't know if y'all have noticed this before, but for some folks, it's almost as if it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. So it's relevant for us to notice if any kind of fatalism like that comes up when we're imagining the future, right? And say wanting to wage some resistance, whether it's to right, the 30 meter telescope on Mauna Kea or any of these other tech bro development projects that many of us have legit concerns around and that so often just get diminished, again, using this weaponized language like 
you have a problem with any kind of technology, you must just be so primitive. How anti-science, how anti-technology, right? So we've got to be able to name that ridiculousness so that those aren't stuck points anymore in our dialogues around what does and doesn't need to happen within our communities. And so before we go more right into that particular topic, I've actually got a question for you that I would like to pause to get into for a moment. Um, and if you'd like to write this down, you're more than welcome to do so. I'm curious to get a sense of your personal history with technology. What's that been like so far in your life? So say if you had access to it when you were a kid, did you geek out on electronics? Or perhaps you shunned anything with wires? Were you into TV, maybe radio? Video games, Game Boys perhaps, Atari, maybe glitter guns, bedazzlers or mixers were more of your thing? Was the pen and paper your style of technology? Did you yearn to have access to a certain kind of technology or a gadget? What role, if any, did these forms of tech play in how you interacted with others? What role did these forms of tech play in how you potentially disconnected maybe with the earth, your body, your spirit. I bring some of these curiosities in right now because it's super helpful to gauge our baseline, right, historical relationship with tech as we're trying to, right, understand the role that tech is playing within our lives and in the world today with a little bit more nuance. So for instance, if people have, right, maybe some really warm and fuzzy memories that involve technology in their youth could have been, right, bonding over playing a video game or watching a particular TV show or something such as that, that can actually skew towards people having a little bit of a positive bias that can potentially get in the way of otherwise understanding some legit concerns related to technology. So again, that's one of the reasons why it's super important for us to just pause and to see what's the kind of storytelling or meaning making that we're already engaged in related to tech, right? So then we can integrate that into, right, any kind of study, assessment, right, learning, unlearning that we might engage moving forward. Um, so thank you for taking a moment just to kind of pause and to reflect upon some of those questions. And around the piece related to connecting with the earth or potentially disconnecting from the earth, I'd like to actually pull in a couple of words from the legendary Dakota scholar, Dr. Vine Deloria Jr. So I'm curious, right, for us to listen to a couple of minutes of his concerns related to the toll that much technology is actually having on people today. So how about we pause and we listen to some of these words from one of the most legendary scholars in the field of American Indian studies within the history of that field. Let's have a listen. Technology has been the death of our species. I mean, we are going to become extinct. And, and that is technology allows you to mechanically extend your capabilities. You know, telephone lets you talk to people 500 miles away when they would be in voice range. A car allows you to travel where you'd have to walk. So as you have those mechanical things, that just pries you loose from relating to the earth. And uh, it goes on and on and on. Pretty soon you're totally abstract. And what we do to make a living in the United States now is we move paper from desk to desk. It has nothing to do with the world or reality. So there's no way to stop it because it's useful to individuals and millions of individuals make a decision and this kicks technology into a higher gear. And we don't really know what we're doing now. But we have more of these labor-saving devices which take away our time, so we have no time. And uh, it, it's going to be the death of us, I mean, sooner or later. Uh, the whole thing just going to melt down. Or 
it's going to drive people crazy. They're just going to get out in the streets, start shooting each other. I mean, yeah, I don't think you can take the psychological pressure of being in a situation where you start out a human being, you start adding these extensions to yourself, and finally you find yourself part of the machine, and there's no way to get out. And I don't think people are built for that psychologically. I think it's going to blow. So, as I'm sure you might have observed, right, that is uh, definitely not a sort of techno-fundamentalist position or a techno-optimistic position that Dr. Deloria is sharing with us. And especially related to what technology does to our relationship with the Earth. Did y'all notice some of his musings around that? So that so much technology, right, enables a disconnection from the material realm. And in a way that, if you ask me, absolutely, right, enables the kind of vampirism and extractivism that we're dealing with today, that's ravaging the planet today, that's a principal driver of, right, climate chaos and catastrophe today, is specifically folks being so checked out from any kind of place-based ethics, we're going to talk more about that later on this season, or any kind of ecological awareness, we're going to talk more about that later this season also, um, that then we can engage in ecocide, right, the killing of the earth or of land, atrocities on that front because we're so disconnected that people either might not even notice or, frankly, they might not even care. Uh, and so on that front, of course, this isn't the only perspective that we have available to us at all whatsoever. Um, and so it's important for me to bring in a tremendous alternative, and that is actually utilizing technology, right? Co-opting some tech in a way that is incredibly invigorating, if you ask me. So I want to bring in some of the work of Professor Beth Lipense, who is an indigenous gamer designer, right, who created this legendary game that's called Thunderbird Strike. Um, and you can see here some of her tremendous illustration, right? There's the kind of, right, Thunderbird Strike video game that I was mentioning. And you see here, right, some Thunderbirds amidst this petra-capitalist backdrop. Um, in this game, right, this Thunderbird is actually attempting to stop this, right, petra-capitalist black snake, so to speak, right, that is ravaging Turtle Island for the sake of profit. So it's a bit of a, right, water protectors or land defenders video game. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, it's been accused of terrorism by people. Um, it's definitely not just perpetuating some of the same default biases that get so deeply entrenched within, right, gaming culture, right, and the kind of communities or, right, subcultural spaces that so often are horrifically sexist, right, and violent, quite often racist, um, but instead really wanting to offer some substantial pushback, right, within that technological medium, but that is sharing something that could sort of wake people up from the status quo values that are based into so much of the gaming scene, for sure on Turtle Island in the settler colonial U.S., and so, again, doesn't have to be, right, just perpetuating so much of the horrific, extractive, right, oppression that we've talked about, um, but it does really merit noticing some of the amazing projects that people have been working on on that front already, so we can learn with humility, right, from what has come before, and some of the kind of labor that people are, right, concurrently getting into right now. Um, I also want to share, right, some languaging from a book called New Dark Age by James Bridle that came out a couple of years ago related to, right, 
how we even think about technology to begin with, right? To really support us in growing a techno skeptical, right, perspective. So within this text, Bridal shares, quote, our technologies are complicit in the greatest challenges we face today, an out of control economic system that emiserates many and continues to widen the gap between rich and poor, the collapse of political and societal consensus across the globe resulting in increasing nationalisms, social divisions, ethnic conflicts and shadow wars and a warming climate. And so around that, I bring that in because unfortunately, so many people legit think that technology is just neutral. Have you ever heard that before? Sometimes folks will say that right through phrases along the lines of technology isn't inherently good or bad. It's how you use it. Have you ever heard someone say something like that before? I have definitely heard that so many times over the course of my life. And it's often said with a sense of smugness, as if somebody's just being a realist and stating things the way that they are. But that's actually a woefully naive misunderstanding. Technology is not neutral. Bridal writes, quote, New technologies don't merely augment our abilities, but actively shape and direct them for better and for worse. It's increasingly necessary to be able to think new technologies in different ways and to be critical of them in order to meaningfully participate in that shaping and directing. What's required is not understanding, but literacy. And around that, he shares a concept that is super helpful here, if you ask me. It's called computational thinking. And I'd really like for us to take seriously this concept. So he says that the second danger of a purely functional understanding of tech is what I call computational thinking. Computational thinking is an extension of what others have called solutionism, the belief that any given problem can be solved by the application of computation. Whatever the practical or social problem we face, there's an app for it. Have any of you ever heard this before? How helpful to know that there's a name for that phenomena of folks being like, you don't need to learn the name of your neighbors. You don't need to engage in revolution. You don't need to seriously consider direct action. I'm sure there's an app for all of that. And if you ask me, this right computational thinking is super pervasive in areas where people don't seem to demonstrate having any kind of awareness of it. What might be some examples of computational thinking? I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I hear people talking about what we could say are epiphanies or revelations. And what do they say? Oh, I just had a download. Did you notice that? Where's the term download come from, right? Does that have anything to do with computers, <laughs> right? And what's at stake here if your understanding of what here I'm loosely calling, say, an epiphany or a revelation is just getting characterized as a download, right? Like akin to a file that was attached to an email that somebody sent you, right? In a realm such as what we could talk about as, say, right, perception, spirituality, cognition, right? If we just kind of sloppily impose this computational thinking into that realm, do you realize how much we're going to miss out on and we're going to misunderstand because of this intrusion bleeding into other spaces of computational thinking? I'll give another example. Have you ever heard someone use the term ecosystem? Perhaps when they were referencing a biome more broadly, like the language of computers has anything on the earth. I hear people talk about ecosystems all the time. And unfortunately, most often folks don't seem to demonstrate any kind of awareness of how that is this right 
tech bro Silicon Valley misunderstanding of the earth that so many people just take for granted. Again, if they're coming from a place of having a bias towards techno fundamentalism or techno optimism, right? If they are just all about computational thinking and they're like, oh yeah, I'm just, and they often don't do it consciously, right? Or intentionally, which is why it's so important for us to pay attention to this bias, to share some of this cultural vocabulary so that we can identify it more readily if people are perpetuating that, or maybe if we're that guy and we realize I called something a download once, right? Or I used the word ecosystem before I knew better and before I maybe learn the history of cybernetics and the way that, right, these systems theories even get trafficked into, say, how people understand their, what, nervous systems, right, as networks and nodes, right? Have any of y'all noticed this also even bleeding into some healing modalities also? And again, what's at stake in us recognizing that there's nothing neutral or natural about that? That there are real healing modalities in the world. And if people get so caught up in misunderstanding because they've got such a strong bias towards computational thinking, they might not even be consciously aware Aware of what they're missing out on when they just start copying the way that tech bros have tried to indoctrinate us. So again, this is not just semantic at all. It's actually super consequential. And on that front, and just as a heads up, this is absolutely horrifying, um, but it really merits noticing if we want to understand more deeply what's at stake here, right? The level of trash that we're up against that Professor Vine Deloria was warning us about. So I just want to share a quote from one of the founders of Wired magazine, right? When he was talking about technology as allegedly as beautiful as a cathedral of redwoods and natural creation. And I personally take offense to even write talking about redwoods in community as a cathedral. Like people can get that Christian bias away from not ecosystems, right, but the earth and species, totally unnecessary. But what does he say? And again, this is horrifying, just to give you a heads up. Quote, there's more of God in a cell phone than a tree frog, because the cell phone is an additional layer of evolution over a tree frog. This is the kind of techno supremacy over nature that these tech bros believe in. How does someone get so completely out of touch? I'm going to repeat that again, just so that we can have a little bit of clarity about how horrifically clueless tech bros are, right? Founder of Wired Magazine. This is like one of the periodicals of the periodicals of tech bros. Quote, there's more of God in a cell phone than a tree frog because the cell phone is an additional layer of evolution over a tree frog. Do y'all see how dangerous that kind of mentality is? Do you understand how instrumental that is in being able to enable the ecocide and the climate catastrophe that is currently disproportionately massacring some of us overwhelmingly that aren't in Silicon Valley? So this is, again, part of what is at stake in us taking seriously, really being able to name as quickly as possible the ridiculous misunderstandings within techno-fundamentalism or within the techno-optimist mentality that's one of the most pernicious biases within the settler colonial U.S. today but also throughout the planet, right, as a principal form of neocolonialism. Uh, and so again, Bridal and New Dark Age says, all too often new technologies are presented as inherently emancipatory, but this itself is an example of computational thinking. 
Uh, and the thing is around that, computational thinking doesn't make room for critical thinking. So he continues, we find ourselves today connected to vast repositories of knowledge, and yet we've not learned to think. And so this is why I want to sincerely encourage us to consider what techno-skepticism might allow for us to be able to discern and parse out what on earth is going on within this mainstream dogma. So he shares, for instance, within, again, this text, A New Dark Age, referring to both the nature and the opportunity of the present crisis that we find ourselves within, an apparent inability to see clearly what's in front of us and to act meaningfully with agency and justice in the world and through acknowledging this darkness to seek new ways of seeing by another light, right? So really getting into even how the metaphors that are used within techno-optimism obfuscate, as in they often obscure more than they illuminate. And what might be an example of that? Have you noticed the way that tech bros talk about clouds? So especially as a guiding metaphor when people talk about data storage. So, oh, just save something into the cloud, so to speak. I'm sure many, if not all of y'all are familiar with that languaging. The thing is clouds so often come across as somewhat, right, ethereal, somewhat immaterial. But for those of us that have actually learned about data storage, the thing is, data storage is imminently material. Data storage has a substantial footprint on the Earth. Do clouds have footprints on the Earth? So do you see how that's just one example of so many where we can really get into trouble if we just sort of buy into or comply with some of these guiding tech bro or techno optimistic forms of storytelling and meaning making without being a little bit more judicious in terms of our discernment. Pretty sneaky, isn't it? And some of us would actually write who might feel strongly about clouds also take issue with that kind of co-optation. I definitely do myself. Uh, and so I would also like us to really consider within uh, another bit of a personal invitation or experiment here how your tech usage looks today in your life. So I asked you a few minutes ago to do a little bit of a retrospective, to pause and to see what are the default right memories and associations related to tech that you're even bringing into this moment right now. We can also pause and ask in this moment, what's your relationship with technology? And the thing is, it might be a mixed bag for many of us, so to speak, and that really merits acknowledging, right, that technology, especially, say, if it comes to medical assistive devices, can be absolutely life-saving for people. And if people feel, right, some sense that we don't have room for nuance or complexity in our understanding, then those realities can get sort of swept under the rug or minimized or diminished in a way that's not helpful for our understanding. So again, certain components of technology may have saved our lives, and that's incredibly important to be truthful about if you ask me, right? Or technology, especially in the realm of social media, right, might have been instrumental in allowing you to be able to connect with loved ones, other people's tech use might impact you in less advantageous ways. A classic example of this might be, say, screen time at the dinner table as opposed to connecting with people over meals. And so I'm curious just to get a little bit of a sense of what your personal relationship with technology is currently. And again, feel free to interpret the language of tech however you like here. So whether it's, again, the tech industry, the usage of medical assistive devices, online dating apps, you're welcome to observe whatever your initial interpretations are. And I really encourage you to not feel any kind of pressure to overthink this. And one of the reasons why I invite that pause to reflect 
is because when it comes to social media, in particular, digital technologies, which often take up a lot of airtime and dialogues around tech more broadly, many of our associations can be positive, so to speak, in ways that are meaningful and true and real. Being able to see, right, photos of family members that might live, right, in geographically distant areas that would be prohibitive to be able to connect with face-to-face -face for most of us most of the time. And again, it's important important to be honest about that. But however, right, what are some other realities that it's also important to be honest about, especially as we segue into considering the role of digital media? Well, what's one of the things that, say, Dr. Sophia Umoja Noble teaches us in the classic text, Algorithms of Oppression? She says, quote, no one can eat the digital, end quote. I'll say it again, no one can eat the digital, quote, end quote. So she teaches about so much that really merits noticing if you're not familiar with the concept of algorithmic oppression already, or what Dr. Kathy O'Neill talks about as what are algorithms, opinions that get coded. Uh, and so, right, she reminds us that Google's an advertising platform, and that even though it's an advertising platform, unfortunately, studies have shown that 70% of search engine users think that search engine results are accurate, right? So it really merits noticing when we're interfacing with the digital that so often, even as we're getting sold to, right, people actually think, again, what are they defaulting to? These baseline biases or presuppositions about just learning in some factual way, right, with some kind of, right, enhanced accuracy or truth value, but that's actually super erroneous. And what's one of the most famous examples that she shares about that on the internet? That the internet has overwhelmingly won what? coded women as girls. And for years, if you were to want to right, go into a search engine to see, right, say typing in girls of color, black girls, for example, Latinx girls, to see what came up, pornography was the overwhelming result of those kinds of searches. So it is really important to pause and to recognize with some of that research and with some of those examples that it really merits right having a critical intersectional take on what is otherwise fronting as, again, just logical, data-driven, fact-based, right, search engine, uh, result yielding that many people take seriously, right, as a part of doing homework assignments and their youth and so on and so forth. Um, also, on that front, if you're interested, there's a text called The Intersectional Internet that I'd really invite y'all to check out. Uh, and of course, right, it bears acknowledging that social media in particular, Facebook for sure, also WhatsApp, frankly, which is owned by Facebook, have had horrifically murderous and fascistic results when it comes to elections throughout the form supporting the rise of fascism, most famously in India, in the Philippines, in Brazil, and in the settler colonial US. Uh, and so around that, of course, there's a plethora of research that really merits our taking quite seriously. So if you're not familiar with it already, even as much as it has problems that I invite us to consider, the great hack and the social dilemma are right requisite viewing material, this couple of documentaries, if you're not familiar with them already. Um, and really inviting people to pause and to reflect upon the extent to which advertising, right, psychographics, psychometrics might have just gotten normalized in some of the spaces online where we find ourselves. And so just wanting to write definitely acknowledge that it's important for us to take some of those materials seriously, right? What was the principle, one of the principal insights, say, within the great hack that what, quote, psychographics should be classified as weapons, quote, end quote. Uh, and so this is a form of information warfare, right? Riffing off of and building successively on some of what we were talking about last week when we're pulling weeds in the realm of psychological warfare. 
And so on that front, right, really merits noticing, right, if your social media usage historically and contemporarily has been impacted in ways around that that you might have noticed. And if not, what haven't you noticed yet? Uh, so how does tech usage impact your quality of connections? Also something that I sincerely encourage us to consider in the human realm as well. I know we were talking about our relationship with the earth or disconnect with the earth earlier. And in terms of what we can do around some of this materially, as we are building out techno skepticism within our lives, you know I want to encourage us to take right cybersecurity quite seriously, right? So whether it's in the realm of hacking, identity theft, potential stalking, domestic violence, government surveillance, trolling, the corporate mining of data, this material is relevant across all of those fronts. So I don't know if you use Signal or Firefox or even Privacy Badger's browser extension, if you have enabled two-step authentication on all of your devices. We've each got different digital security needs, right? So depending upon our vulnerabilities, depending upon the kind of work that we do in the world, um, how much personally identifiable data of ours and our loved ones we share or might be stored online. And so I really invite us to see this as a kind of boundary setting work, right? We could say, digital boundary setting work. So Hack Blossoms, right, feminist DIY cybersecurity guide, for example, says, quote, you have power to set boundaries and protections in your digital spaces as you see fit. We hope that this guide will help you make informed personal decisions around what is right for you. Uh, and so, again, if that's not something that you and your loved ones have already done, I sincerely encourage you to take, right, brushing up on cybersecurity incredibly seriously, especially in these times. Uh, and so much more material for us to get into around all of this, what is right technically wrong, right, riffing off of another legendary text related to sexist apps. Um, but this is actually just about time for us to begin wrapping up already. So in closing, I especially want to encourage you to ask yourself if you've got any tech-related habits or practices that you might be interested in repatterning. Perhaps that looks like less screen time, or maybe say not letting yourself look at a screen in the morning or evening till you've tried to look at the sunrise or the sunset or the moonrise or the moonset, or perhaps less time scrolling on social media. Maybe you're open to time tracking your time with electronics or setting a boundary around when you'll let yourself access uh, whatever it might be, game, social media, online pornography, television show, Netflix, etc. So please consider tailoring this invitation to your needs. For example, caregivers sometimes have different tech requirements to make sure that children, elders, and other dependents are safe. Of course, we've all got our own relevant access needs as well. And sometimes you might need to write, do quick check-ins to ensure that there's not, say, an emergency at work or something such as that. Maybe some of y'all might be interested in what gets called digital detoxes, or perhaps setting up auto responders to decrease the likelihood that you say check email during certain times. Maybe you want to consider disenabling desktop notifications or phone notifications wherever that's available to you. Perhaps you want to, if you're on Facebook, set up a Facebook feed blocker on your phone or on your computer, right? Maybe you want to take seriously some of those examples of securitizing against intrusion that I mentioned earlier, or perhaps you're down to get political in a little more collective way, whether that looks like organizing for net neutrality, antitrust laws, or otherwise. In closing, as you're considering all of that, I also just really want to bring in our bodies and our embodied awareness, right? To encourage you to consider, how does your tech usage impact your relationship with your body? 
what you notice within your body and what perhaps you don't. Uh, so much more for us to get into, especially related to the impact of tech on policing, on sentencing, on the prison industrial complex, but to be continued around all of that later this autumn. Um, as we begin to part ways, I really invite you to pause before continuing to scroll to take a little bit of time to integrate some of this material that we got into. I encourage you to share also if you know anyone that might find any of this material beneficial. Also, if you're down to kick down any funds right on PayPal or on Patreon to be able to support us in continuing on with this kind of labor, that would be rad. And I'm looking forward to continuing on with some of this Freedom weeding and seeding. That's it for today's episode of Feral Visions, a decolonial feminist podcast brought to you by Liberation Spring. I've been your host, Anjali Nathupadia, and I thank you for listening. I'm also curious to know what this dialogue evoked for you. I invite you to post your reflections and questions in the comments section below to continue our collective journey of unlearning, remembering, and imagining. If you want to share feedback, such as segment ideas or potential guests you'd like to hear on the show, email liberationspring at gmail.com. And don't forget to follow Feral Visions on SoundCloud or iTunes, where you can find our show archive. If you'd like more information on this show's topic or to donate to the project, check out liberationspring.com. Thanks to Catherine Petru and Nicole Gervasio of our technical production team and Climbing Poetry for our theme song. Be sure to tune in for next week's episode. And in the meantime, let's make our ancestors proud. The power of the people is louder than the evil. Deceitful and coward, people in power. All power to the people is the hour of the peaceful. Freedom is ours, yeah. Freedom is ours.